Thanks for all the work you put into it. This uh, environment seems super impressive, uh, and I appreciate everybody who's joined to listen to me speak. Um, I uh, hope that I can engage you in a conversation around uh, the uh, interaction of formal ontologies and historical research. Um, I'll try to keep within my uh, boundaries and uh, take uh, half an hour. Um, Basically, uh, the goal of my talk is to address the question of uh, formal ontologies. Uh, they sound interesting, uh, but uh, why uh, would you put so much emphasis on uh, formal ontologies and semantic data uh, in putting together a consortium of uh, and a, a network, uh, a group of uh, people working on history and using digital data? So. I'm going to make an argument for why I think it's a fundamental uh, interest. Uh, and um, I'm really doing the 50,000 feet bird's eye view of this conversation, uh, which I hope will sort of fit together with the many presentations, many interesting uh, papers and posters that are proposed in this conference, uh, and uh, that it will create an interesting dialogue. Um, so. Now I learned how to go forward in my presentation. Oh, maybe I have to go here. Yes, okay, great. So my presentation will happen in three parts. Uh, it's gonna start easy. I'm going to explain formal ontology and CDOC CRM simply. Um, it'll be a recap for most, uh, I imagine. Then I want to make the argument why I think it's a fundamental concern uh, to think about formal ontology in the practice of historical research. And then I want to point out how, although it's a fundamental concern, there's a lot of work to do in terms of applying an ontology like CDOC CRM or some other uh, to create the kinds of uh, integrated, uh, consolidated information networks that Torthin was uh, referring to earlier. So step one, recapping what is a formal ontology and what is CDOC CRM? You can make, make a coffee if you already know this. Um, so here I don't want to present a bunch of theory. I want to put it into your mind as a practical uh, uh, activity uh, if you're thinking of it as a, somebody who's not very familiar with uh, formal ontology. So if data is the uh, fundamental spice uh, of your, uh, of your uh, research life, uh, then a formal ontology uh, is a way to organize your uh, spice drawer, your data, uh, to be compatible with others. Um, organizing it through uh, the tools, the conceptual tools, the formal ontology uh, that you make or adopt uh, gives you, uh, allows you to do more interesting uh, searching on your data. And ideally, um, because you've uh, used this groundwork of existing uh, concepts and uh, defined data forms, uh, it can make your data more sustainable and reusable. Um, another thing to point out is that um, when you're doing research, you're doing historical research, at the moment that you start gathering facts uh, for primary or secondary sources and put them together in a uh, organized format, uh, as simple as a spreadsheet up to a complex uh, a database, commercial or self-made, you're doing data modeling anyhow. Um, ontologies like CDOC CRM uh, offer themselves as tools uh, to help create accurate thought through data models um, that are oriented towards long-term uh, sustainability and integratability of uh, the data that you're uh, producing uh, in this research in digital formats. Um, I'm putting out terms which I'll explain as I go along. Uh, I mean, formal ontologies uh, come out of a, a school of computer science that uh, in one sense, uh, one name for it is knowledge representation. Uh, and uh, if there's a godfather of knowledge representation, uh, that would probably be uh, uh, Herr Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, and uh, his uh, work of the Tractatus. Um, 
And so he has a, some very famous uh, sayings, one of which is a proposition is a picture, a model of reality. A proposition shows its sense how things stand, if it is true, and says that things do so stand. Um, so basically there's this field, subfield in computer science of knowledge representation, uh, which is interested in, in adopting uh, formal tools of uh, philosophical, logical analysis and trying to isolate high level concepts and uh, relations that define uh, the basic terms and basic uh, interrelations between terms in some field of study uh, so that you can create data points in your data world that are uh, propositional matches, pictures. The model is a picture uh, that shows how the world is uh, and, uh, it, and states that it is so. Uh, so in this case, my world is this uh, strange dog, uh, and uh, uh, my simple model would be that there are tables, dogs, and chairs in uh, in this world, and that they're so disposed that the dog sits in the chair and the chair is in front of the table. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you end up with, uh, but hopefully much more abstract and useful. Um, other sort of fundamentals to point to uh, are that... Um, Formal ontologies, uh, which are these uh, systems of what are called classes and relations or classes and properties, uh, are um, first done in an, in an intellectual e exercise where you do an analysis of some field of discourse uh, and you arrive at high level, these high level concepts that describe the things that are talked about and how they're related. Of course, we're not trying to do pure theory, we're trying to do computer science to aid research. Uh, so uh, putting uh, that uh, theory into practice requires some sort of uh, uh, format, some sort of serialization of the intellectual constructs we come up with. So a very popular one, uh, uh, pretty standard, is the resource description framework, uh, which allows you to declare classes uh, and uh, properties, so a class is represented in these diagrams that you'll see in a few other places as a little square, and uh, the relationship between two classes is indicated by a line. Um, and uh, I like to point out that the classes essentially operate like generic nouns, and the properties essentially operate like generic verbs. Um, and they allow you to uh, connect uh, real instances of things in the world uh, via uh, defi a defined set of uh, linguistic terms. And they allow you to form simple sentences in the sense of subject verb object, uh, which are, which as long as you refer to the instances of things in the world with the same identifiers, allow you to make infinitely long chains of factual relationships, uh, which is this graph model of creating data as opposed to uh, a, a table model or um, other modalities. Um, another thing to point out is, uh, is the advantage of adopting semantic data uh, and um, the power of representation that it gives you. I've condensed this, which could you could talk about for a while into uh, one uh, very tight slide, uh, is uh, a notion of inheritance. Um, so in this slide, the top part is what I've called the platonic realm of forms, the ontology. So this is the, these are the classes and, prop and, and properties that we've declared in our ontology that allow us to say things about something in the world. And they have what's called an is a relationship within them. Uh, and the is a relationship is an inheritance relationship, which means that uh, if I declare a class, a subclass, uh, via is a to another class, then I say, whatever you can say about a higher level class, like animal, you can also say about the lower level class, like bird. So uh, here I've declared in this uh, phantom ontology uh, that animals have limbs. Uh, and so it means that I can make a statement about birds that they have limbs. Um, so I can talk about knowledge at a very general level, and I can talk about knowledge at a more specific level. So I can talk about this uh, emu as an animal, or I can talk about it as a bird. Uh, and then as you develop your ontology, um, 
which is the language which we will use, you will use to express your data, uh, you create the finer grain classes and properties that you really need to capture the thing that it is that you're researching. So, you know, again, in this toy example, you know, if my interest is uh, uh, dogs and dogs and birds, uh, then I might make a sub property of, uh, of a property uh, so that uh, the property has limb, has a sub property, has wing, so I can be more specific and talk about wings of birds and not limbs of birds and not mix up, you know, birds having legs when they can only have wings, if that was how biology works, of course it doesn't. Um, and we set up this framework of classes and properties uh, in order to be able to answer uh, research questions, in order to be able to answer the uh, whatever's in our uh, frame of epistemological interest. Uh, and so uh, ultimately, as we create these ontologies, uh, we are creating a small customized, formalized language, which allows us to represent the things that are in our domain of research. Uh, and we need to document and show them in a way that allows us to uh, formulate queries. Uh, we could talk about Sparkle and other things, but we don't have time. Um, so that you can answer real research questions uh, on uh, very large, uh, ideally, sets of data. Uh, and finally, uh, on our final slide of introducing what we're talking about with formal ontology and semantic data, uh, I want to point to uh, CDOC CRM, um, which is the International Council of Documentation's Conceptual Reference Model. Um, this is a formal ontology that's been developed since uh, the mid-90s uh, until today. Uh, it's in its seventh version, uh, it, and... Um, it was initially drawn up uh, as part of a response to trying to come up with a way of creating a generic structure for rep representing museum database information. Uh, and following the path of doing conceptual modeling uh, resulted in a generalized um, uh, intellectual model for representing uh, the history of uh, cultural heritage, um, objects uh, through time and space, uh, including uh, individuals. So, um, and yeah, you, the, yeah, the reason that this model lends itself um, as especially initially at least interesting uh, to historical study and the representation of historical information is that uh, the main mode of representation that's been adopted is called this event-oriented model. And the event-oriented model means that uh, whenever we have uh, reference to time or space, instead of um, in many documentation systems, there's a formal collapse of the relationship between objects or people or concepts and the time and the space uh, that they that describe them. Uh, but actually, uh, these descriptors of time and space, like 1979 or Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, uh, when related to an actor like George Brusiker, um, have no meaning or uh, can't be used for interesting historical interpretation unless we introduce events into the model that allow us to understand how different uh, 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 parameters, uh, how different, uh, how objects, people, and concepts uh, come into relationship through time and space. So the identification of those, uh, that time and space is actually my birth date. So if you're modeling such a thing uh, and you wanted to have, you know, follow the progression of George, uh, then you would want to represent not just George 1979 in Edmonton, Alberta, but the uh, confluence of George in the event of birth that happened at a place and a time, and then there would be other people involved and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, I'm going to not delve further into uh, CDOC CRM models right now. Um, why is this interesting uh, to history and to historians? Um, I want to start with a, a reasonable skept skepticism. You could say that formal ontologies are old fashioned, an old fashioned effort at AI, and we should move on to machine learning. 
uh, you might think uh, this sounds like an abstract computer science game, not particularly related to historians' research. Um, you could cynically say this is something one references in a project proposal to get some money, but then doesn't do much about, or as a fancy tool for techies uh, that I don't want to be interested in. Uh, and I'll skip Aristotle and Heidegger, just a little nod. Um, CDOC CRM, on the other hand, you, you could skeptically relate to and say, oh, well, that's a museum data standard, but we want to talk about history, or that's a data standard that lacks the expressivity uh, required for my data. So in this section, I want to look at how uh, counterintuitively uh, there is a strong um, coordination of interests, or they should be, between uh, the practice of doing history and the practice of doing knowledge engineering. So prima facie, um, you could say historians and knowledge engineers are poles apart. Um, poles apart, why? Essentially because the uh, target of their interest uh, from the start differs. Uh, Historians generalizing uh, start for primary from primary or secondary documents and attempt to extract and compile facts from them uh, in order to be able to analyze those facts, in order to reconstruct historical particulars potentially, and beyond that, perhaps offer theses for historical evolutions. If you're a historiography a historiographer, and I've crucified a historical process. Uh, I beg your forgiveness. Um, on the other hand, a knowledge engineer isn't interested in the particulars of history. Uh, their target of uh, analysis are data structures, the manuals that describe those, and uh, what they work on uh, is to try to understand what those data structures say uh, in order to uh, extract these concepts of relationships. I, uh, mentioned to you earlier, in order to try to compile both basic level concepts and relations that are very close to what the data says, and then these higher level generalizations allow you to create uh, more uh, broad connections between various phenomena. So bird and dog or animal, for example. <laughs> um, so this is the notion of generalization of lower level concepts and relations to broad abstractive classes. Um, However, despite those seem to be, seeming to be two different trajectories, I would argue uh, they are trajectories that meet uh, in that the historian in dealing with uh, primary documents, secondary documents to extract facts in order to do uh, uh, factually grounded, empirically grounded research uh, is interested in the present world in extracting explicit and reusable digitized facts. And this interest is common to the knowledge engineer uh, who, while uh, taking a different uh, generalizing, um, looking at the species of the fact rather than the individual fact uh, when looking at documents, nevertheless, there's exactly the co-interest uh, in understanding how to represent uh, explicit reusable digitized facts. The historian fundamentally wants to represent some real facts about the past. The knowledge engineer wants to create uh, the structure whereby that that can be uh, represented accurately to the intention of the historian's uh, re-representation of this fact. So I think uh, that there is a um, meeting of interests um, between these fields uh, that is, uh, uh, and, and it lands on the digital document um, in its senses on the one hand as a mirror of an analog document. So many times either through automated or manual processes uh, we move from an analog source to a digital source in order to do research um, and uh, that uh, formation of that data um, is a key element to um, the representation of the past. Um, 
Born digital documents, of course, many, uh, you know, if we're doing more contemporary uh, historical research, then uh, we already have to do an analysis of the kinds of documents that are produced uh, already uh, it, it, natively in a digital environment. And then, of course, there's also the structures that historians themselves produce uh, in order to not mirroring an, an original source, but uh, creating uh, a new uh, document format in order to uh, compile and put together the uh, facts that they're trying to uh, gather and understand in order to make their uh, historical analysis. Um, so this is where the interests meet. And I would argue that there's a massive opportunity here um, to uh, combining uh, the practices of knowledge engineering and historical research with the focus on uh, deriving uh, facts out of documents, and in particular the digital documents, uh, in order to uh, support and uh, make uh, stronger the practice, I mean, to give better tools to historians in the digital age. Um, and doing knowledge engineering uh, will allow us to make more facts, more tractable uh, to uh, more scholars in order to do the thing that they ultimately want to do, uh, which is to uh, build arguments, contest uh, uh, theories, uh, and um, engage in the scholarly debate of what, in fact, is the case in the past. Um, this can only be possible if we're working uh, at the same time at with methods like knowledge engineering, uh, which are attempting to uh, get close to the facts, get close to the, the, the true uh, bits of information that people want to work on and rendering them uh, in a way that is explicit and reusable. And uh, so that we move beyond data structures uh, that force us to put comments uh, uh, upon comments in comment fields. Um, and at the same time, we come at, uh, come at it from other angles in order to create tools that will exploit these uh, data sets and allow us to uh, do interesting things with them in an efficient manner. So now you might say, well, that sounds nice, but uh, anyhow, I'm a historian and uh, I'm not particularly uh, that sounds like a project. Uh, my project is doing uh, history, and so I think I, I can avoid this. So the strong argument is that you can't. Uh, and uh, history and historical research, uh, like um, every other uh, social uh, activity uh, in the past 40 years, has been overwhelmed uh, with this digital deluge and the movement uh, of our uh, social and knowledge production into a digital sphere. So the strong argument uh, that I would like to put forward uh, for argument or debate uh, or a chat uh, is that um, ignoring uh, knowledge engineering and not engaging fundamentally as historians and probably in the pedagogy of uh, histor historiography with knowledge representation leaves historical research uh, at the mercy of others uh, and leaves the, the fundamental work uh, and uh, value uh, that historians produce uh, through the generation of data uh, in jeopardy. Um, because uh, doing history today means building digital and digitized documents. There's no way out of it. Um, and that structuration of digital and digitized documents shapes exactly what can or cannot be recorded. Um, and uh, there is a sort of division of labor, uh, which is, yes, out of date, <laughs> I'll argue, uh, that divides between historians and techies uh, that, I put those are in quotes, that leave the foundational intellectual work choosing how to structure historical data to chance and abuse uh, and this jeopardizes the whole project. And uh, I found this, uh, the limits of my language means the limits of my world, uh, uh, inspirational poster earlier this morning. And I think Wittgenstein would love it as it shows the absolute nonsense uh, of the reuse of, uh, of data uh, without understanding and 
uh, kind of makes the point of why uh, historians uh, ought to engage. Um, I'm running out of time, so I already made this point. C.P. Snow uh, indicated uh, an unnecessary cultural divide between people focused on uh, a more uh, scientific line and humanities line. This is maybe something that uh, drives uh, a lack of take up of knowledge representation and the challenge of understanding how to structure digital documents. So uh, there were, uh, yeah, I had some carrots and now we're at the sticks. So I think uh, failing to take up the challenge of meeting the digital deluge um, will result obviously in poor data. Uh, the inability to integrate facts uh, with other colleagues or even yourself over time. Um, it uh, leads to a lack of open and fair data. Um, it means that it's impossible to capitalize on automation uh, and easing scholarship uh, in order to focus, allow scholars to focus on what they want to do instead of redoing data from the past. The knowledge that is created and stored without re reference to knowledge representation uh, is uh, probably headed towards uh, obsolescence and loss. Um, and in the meantime, um, machine learning and other techniques uh, outpace us in terms of their ability to generate uh, pseudo facts uh, and fill up uh, the space of information with even more nonsense. Uh, so, uh, but a final point on it, um, knowledge representation uh, is, I would argue, a way out. Uh, it needs to be not uh, a domain of specialists uh, who only do that, uh, and it can't take over uh, the historian's task. The historian obviously wants to do history. So collaborations have to come up, uh, which are co-explorations uh, to come to uh, to work in a joint collaboration to do the analysis of the kinds of doing this conference essentially, but to do the analysis on the basic structures that are uh, data structures that are being made to record uh, historical information and come together to create uh, some bulwark of uh, high level representation of information so that uh, some of the possible payouts of adopting uh, the digital can uh, finally be taken up. Uh, and within that, um, the CDOC CRM is an ontology. Uh, it's a, it's a uh, formal ontology artifact of years of knowledge engineering. Um, it has something to offer uh, to the historical community uh, because it offers this existence, uh, high level ontological lingua franca that allows the modeling of historical progressions. Um, it is sustainable because self-documenting it is flexible, and this is characteristic of all uh, ontologies, uh, hopefully, uh, because it doesn't tell you what to document. It gives you a set of patterns by which you can create uh, the documentation structures you need to say the things that, to represent the facts that are actually uh, documented in your primary sources. Um, by adopting it, it's already used, uh, so it creates interoperability. Its fundamental spirit is uh, linked open data and sharing of knowledge. Uh, and it's already got a wider community, which can be broadened by uh, historical uh, researchers. Now, we have section three of my talk, uh, <laughs> which uh, should happen in four minutes, um, which is fine. Um, so, Having made that argument, uh, I want to recognize that there is a really long way to go uh, to make knowledge representation uh, as and CDOC CRM as actionable uh, as we would want it to be in the ideal scenario. Um, and so the points that I want to make are that we need to create better understanding of what it is and how to use it, develop communities around it, expand its ability to uh, uh, express uh, these fundamental facts and to leave it fundamentally open to revision. Uh, so I will storm through those. Um, so first thing is 
if you think that knowledge, formal ontologies and knowledge representation can create a digital lingua franca in order to allow uh, different historians and historical uh, research groups to work together without knowing each other, but simply having data that's compatible, uh, then they have to understand the lingua franca. And there aren't enough people who understand CDOC CRM or any ontology. So uh, there is work that has to be done around creating pedagogical uh, devices and programs uh, in order to make this information, uh, this approach to creating information available uh, within disciplines uh, such as history. So I will just point to the fact that I think that the notion of a, teaching it as a language uh, is an interesting way to go. We need documentation of how it's been done in the past. Uh, there are some references to documentation of patterns here and creating other learning tools like serious games. Um, also fundamental uh, is maintaining and developing communities. So uh, creating uh, ontologies for data integration is not a solipsistic activity. Uh, it involves working together in communities to create these data structures that we can agree uh, that this is, this is a class for events. This is what we mean by events, uh, so that when people go to create information, again, they will take the same classes and the same properties and say the same things with them. Uh, and that's uh, problematic because uh, there's not a lot of... Uh, there are not a lot of formal communities around this. Uh, also, that plug into the real life um, activities of academics, recognition of work and output, um, the uh, uh, yeah recognition of things like developing an ontology is an academic academic activity. Developing a data set is an academic activity. Um, so all of this is our fundamental uh, concerns to be worked on. So obviously I'll make a nod here to Data for History uh, and uh, its multi-year uh, effort uh, to try to create conversations around this in the historical field. I think these are the sorts of fora that will be taken up by the right people at the right time uh, to uh, take advantage of the possibilities of knowledge representation for history. Um, and I have, yeah, I will take three more minutes than I'm supposed to probably. Um, I've already kind of made this point, uh, but I want to remake it quickly here. Um, semantics allow you to have much more granular, much more accurate representation of your information as opposed to uh, being stuck in some preset forms that you have to uh, fix your data into. Um, but we still haven't done enough work in figuring out ways to take advantage of that, uh, uh, of this uh, granularity of data in order to give uh, means to scholars uh, to create data in a natural uh, and uh, useful way and query it so that they don't have to have a degree in knowledge representation to understand the data that they've made. Um, so I just point to uh, well-known projects like uh, Research Space, uh, which is trying to create these uh, conceptual mapped ways of uh, generating and querying data. Um, this is a, a time wheel, which is uh, adopted from a uh, general uh, library, uh, but applied in the arches environment, which is another semantic environment, which the kind of things that you could do differently with your semantic data. Um, and I wanted to uh, point to this work uh, of the uh, Maza group, which is a, a archaeological um, research group in France, uh, where they're uh, doing interesting things with trying to represent argumentation. Um, so those are the kinds of expressivity that we can gain, we can get out of semantics. Um, and um, yes, two more minutes. Uh, so the last point is continuous responsible re revision. So, uh, and this should lead to conversation. So CDOC CRM uh, is an open-ended uh, high level ontology that allows you to document uh, uh, the historical evolution of things through time. Um, does that mean uh, it's already solved history's problems of representation? No. Uh, it has been specifically focused towards answering uh, questions within a broader cultural heritage community. Uh, so 
as it's uh, hopefully taken out more and more by different historical projects, uh, there'll be different demands on uh, representing more granular and maybe different information that's been represented so far. Uh, so that uh, is something that is accounted for in the CDOC CRM community or should be accounted for in any uh, formal ontology community that may, may form, uh, that the ontology is always open to revision and must be ex uh, ex extendable uh, downwards in order to gain the information, uh, or the information granulated that's necessary to do uh, analytic research. Um, I don't have to, we can have a side conversation about, this is a, this is a graph uh, that uh, represents some work of Francesco, Breda and myself and uh, others uh, in a group that is creating, uh, trying to create an extension for CDOC CRM called CRM SOC, uh, CRM for Social Life, others who are also present. <laughs> um, but uh, it would be a lecture in itself. Um, so just to say it's ongoing. Um, I will skip this since uh, you need tools to, to do this sort of work. And I want to point towards uh, Francesco, uh, Vincent, and the Lara team's work on creating this software onto me, which might be a solution for doing this collaborative work of generating ontologies. Um, and I want to get to the end because I had a long uh, subtitle, uh, which I want to explain. Uh, so why get past digital history? Um, so I want to round up the argument by saying that the adoption of knowledge engineering techniques in historical research is actually just an extension of the tradition of historiographical methods, but with a new uh, media environment. Uh, the digital epithet uh, comes to be uh, because right now, uh, it is blindingly in front of us uh, and demands a response. Um, but uh, the end goal uh, isn't, to my opinion, uh, to create a digital history, uh, but to confront the digital in such a way that we have the tools uh, to do the continuous work of historical research, representing primary facts accurately and building uh, a, a historical interpretation off of it in this new digital environment. So if CDOC CRM and formal ontologies are languages, uh, then languages work best uh, just when we aren't thinking about them, when they aren't the, when I don't think about the words that I'm saying right now, but I simply communicate a message to you and you simply focus on the meaning that I was intending to you. Uh, and so I hope that someday we'll get there. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs>